AIDS. A simple drop of blood, like the one on my finger, is all that's required to determine that I'm not HIV positive and therefore unlikely to be an AIDS carrier. But what if my test result turned out to be positive, like that of Victor's here? Right, come up, we're ready to do that test now. The question of what happens next and how to deal with it is a complex one indeed. The answer has always been, we don't know how to prevent it. And recent research has revealed that it's quite possible to carry the immune deficiency virus for 10 years before AIDS symptoms begin to appear. Kaposi's sarcoma, a cancer which produces purplish spots on the skin, is often the first sign of AIDS, by which stage attempts at prevention are too late. Australian researchers at the Victorian Mental Health Research Institute in Melbourne, under the leadership of Dr John Curry, have developed a quick and accurate method to help diagnose AIDS at an early stage. It's a computer-controlled eye movement test. The patient is required to wear this special headset and then to follow a moving target on the screen. There are 18 little infrared transmitters here and a receiver on either side and they follow the movements of the eye and then feed that information into the computer. Here we are, Doctor. Thank you. Now, if you can turn around and watch the screen there. And... The test, which is an adaptation of a technique known as infrared oculography, was initially developed by the Institute to study Alzheimer's disease as it provides an extremely accurate method of monitoring brain damage. Bring your chin forward here. Those. Okay, Jen, step around. Yeah. Thanks. It's been adapted to detect AIDS dementia complex, a form of progressive brain deterioration that can appear in up to 25% of HIV positive patients in advance of other AIDS symptoms. Early diagnosis of this dementia means treatment with potentially helpful drugs can begin earlier. So Victor, how long ago was it that you, uh, you were first tested as, uh, as HIV positive? Five years ago. Five years ago. Yes. And what sort of symptoms made you aware of the fact that you eventually had AIDS? Well, I didn't have any symptoms until I, until I got the pneumonia. Mm -hmm. So which was how long ago? That was about a month ago. And as far as the possibility of having any degree of dementia, what sort of symptoms have you had of that? Well, the other day, I, uh, it took me about 15 minutes to sign my name. Sign your own name? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Different aspects of our vision are controlled by different parts of our brains. And this is why the eye movement test has proved to be a good indicator of brain function. For example, to track a fast-moving object visually, this part of the brain is used. Whereas to follow a slow-moving object, this area is used. An error in any one of those functions indicates damage to the related section of the brain, so that the progress of that damage can be accurately monitored with regular eye tests with this device. Okay. As the patient watches the moving laser spot, the infrared sensors detect how quickly or slowly and how accurately the patient's eyes follow the spot. The results can be translated from digital information into an easily read graph. The next step is to analyze the graphs from the infrared oculography. For example, my reading shows a steady line here, which indicates that I've been able to follow the moving target reasonably well. Now, if you were able to squeeze that graph up into a different time frame, you'd end up with something like that, which is the graph of a person with normal reactions. Someone with moderate AIDS dementia, though, would produce a much more irregular graph, indicating that they've been unable to follow the moving target as well. Then, for someone with severe AIDS dementia, the irregularities become much more pronounced, indicating that the disease has progressed further. The eye movement test is likely to play a significant role in the search for an AIDS cure. It's believed that during the course of the disease, up to 90% of AIDS sufferers may develop some degree of dementia. So one way the success of the hundreds of anti-AIDS drugs that are under experimentation could be assessed is by monitoring the progress of AIDS dementia with this test. The weirdest bicycle in the world and how it works. That's after the break. 
the latest technology, Tuesdays at 9.30 Eastern, 8.30 Central on Next Step. The Air Force has the stealth. Music has Sinatra. Paris has the Eiffel Tower. We have this. The new Maxim from Nissan. In just one year, something happened to 640 million pounds of chemical pollutants. Instead of becoming waste, they were captured for recycling. The members and partners of the Chemical Manufacturers Association, working for change. I think we have a little problem here. Joey has to come with us on vacation. Joey's going on vacation with his own family. I'm not leaving without Joey. They have fantastic pools at this hotel. I do everything with Joey. Well, they have a camp. Uh-uh. Just for kids. A huge water slide. Ginormous water slide. Dear Joey, sorry you couldn't be here. We're all Who'd have thought we'd make such a big splash with everyone? I'm not going home without Max. We've thought of everything at the Hyatt Resorts in the Caribbean. how the Russian Mafia has taken the American dream by storm. Don't miss Vodka Dons, a Discovery Journal special. Tonight at 10 Eastern, 9 Central, contains violent material. Parental discretion is advised. Long before we started worrying about using up the Earth's supply of fossil fuels, people have been stretching their imagination and ingenuity, trying to get from A to B as fast as possible under their own steam. Since the turn of the century, there's been a succession of experiments with weird and wonderful contraptions and with often hilarious results. But now that noise and pollution have become major environmental problems, people power has become a serious business. one of the latest additions to the family of human-powered vehicles. Like its siblings, it's a rather unconventional shape, and as many of them do, it began life as a student project. Christened the Twike, it's somewhere between a car and a bike, and its unique style is certainly making heads turn here in Switzerland. Shall we go? When it first appeared on the roads, the authorities were not quite sure how to classify it. It looks like a futuristic car, but has no engine, so it's licensed as a bicycle. But there too, it's not quite the norm to have two people pedalling side by side. Twike is very light, only 50 kilograms, and that would normally mean it would tend to roll about. But because the riders sit low down, it actually corners well. Human-powered vehicles are the most efficient mode of transport ever built, consuming less energy per kilometre per person than anything else. And this one is no exception. Its thin wedge shape means it's aerodynamically better than any existing car. It has to be to achieve a top speed of 60 kilometres an hour and even a cruising speed of 30, all by pedal power. Driving the twike is like riding a bike lying down. And like a bike, going downhill is exhilarating, but going uphill is a little hard work. The twike is steered by a joystick that can be operated by either driver, and there's a brake attached to that. On this prototype, they've used 21 bike gears, also controlled by a lever on the joystick. Then, of course, there's the pedals. To keep the movement controlled, we both pedal simultaneously. 
But in future models, they're hoping to make the pedals independent of each other so that while Peter does the hard work, I can have a rest. The Twike evolved a few years ago when a group of architecture, design and engineering students from the Federal Institute of Technology decided they'd take their ideas out of the textbook and onto the road. If you have the idea, you have to, to make a shape, you have to design a, a product and you have some new materials. You want to make a very lightweight car and uh, so you have to try uh, the techniques of making uh, making a body with uh, carbon fiber, with epoxy, and uh, you have to, f to fit in all the technical parts you need for, for the, the whole driving system. And there are several problems you, you never met before, you have to solve again. That's that. From the original sketches, they first built a scaled down model uh, to test the aerodynamics in a wind tunnel. Having got that right, they then considered a range of materials to make the construction lightweight and strong. <laughs> For the shell, they decided to use foam coated with carbon fibre and to reinforce the sides, Kevlar. There's independent suspension front and rear and the joystick is linked directly to the front wheel. Spoked wheels would have broken too easily on cornering so they opted for a light, solid construction of aluminium and fibreglass. The group found seat design a problem because existing manufacturers couldn't really help with such a radical new vehicle. So it was back to the drawing board before coming up with a design that maximised comfort and ease of movement. Twike's first big test was the 1986 Vancouver Expo and the interest generated there showed them they were definitely on the right track. They won the International Human Powered Vehicle Competition and it gave them the incentive they needed to form their own company, Twike Engineering. There are certain modifications to be made and even one or two more prototypes to be designed before the Twike will be ready for production. For a start, while it will remain mostly a human powered vehicle, in the back here they'll install a solar powered electric engine to give the old legs a rest going up hills. And another change, the 21 bike gears will be replaced by a gearing system perfect for this kind of vehicle, continuously variable transmission. CVT, as it's called, is a simple but ingenious device which works on the principle of centrifugal force. As the car increases its speed, the pulley expands and when the revs slow down, it contracts again. In this way, the belt rides up and down the contour, ensuring the car is always in the correct gear. It will be a while yet before every discerning Swiss driver has a twine and by that time it will have been through a few changes. Nevertheless, the group has proved the concept will work as an environmentally sound commuter vehicle and some plastics and fiberglass manufacturers are keen to produce it. But the one thing that will never change is its concept as a car that never gets thirsty, unlike its riders. And there's nothing like a cool, refreshing drink after a drive through rush hour traffic. I'm just doing a spot of cosmetic surgery, and it's certainly needed. A plane this size may look pretty solid, but in fact, a little pigeon could knock it out of the sky. You think I jest? Well, take a look at these. Both jets are victims of bird strike in its most extreme form. But damage caused by bird strike or hail is usually not that obvious. Jet airliners can take thousands of knocks with no outward signs of harm. But underneath, it may be a different story, and structural damage usually manifests itself in the most unfortunate way, by causing a plane to crash. Well, about 10 years ago in England, scientists developed a rather novel test for the effects of bird strike. Planes were literally shot at with whole dead chickens, catapulted out of a cannon-like device. Now, that was pretty drastic and a terrible waste of chickens. But a Texan research institute has come up with a paint that will probably do a better job. It has some of the sensitivity of skin. In other words, it bruises. The paint contains millions of microscopic bubbles filled with dye. When it's struck by an object, the bubbles burst 
turning the paint a darker colour. Now, I've painted some here. <clears throat> if you can imagine this hammer is our poor ill-fated pigeon, it takes a few seconds for the bruise to appear. The harder the knock, the darker the bruise. There you can see that the uh, darker patches are appearing. Now, the inventors of bruise paint say it will also be used for spotting structural damage to materials that don't normally dent. It may be a big hit with the airlines, and no doubt the chickens will be highly relieved too. Next on Beyond 2000, turning out a good drop without the chemical additives. Hello? Dad, it's that MCI guy again. Oh, you got my name from Uncle Al. Uh, switch from AT&T? Oh, please, I'm getting married. When someone offers you a deal, find out if it's a real deal. Uh, look, just put the whole deal in writing, and I'll uh, sleep on it. Bye-bye, MCI. <laughs> Your true. surprised what a BMW convertible is going for these days. The new 318i. Thursday nights, nuts and bolts, tools of the trade, machines and magicians on the Discovery Channel. First, how do they do it? Step behind the camera and into the special effects world of movie magic. Then, they seem ordinary, but do we really understand what makes them tick? Look inside the secret life of machines. Thursday, beginning at 9 Eastern, 8 Central, on the Discovery Channel. Today, all across America, families are finally discovering all the things they can do with a family computer. Once they have Prodigy, that is. For parents, there's financial services, like the convenience of paying bills online. There's the chance to communicate with other parents on everything from keeping kids safe to adolescent blues. For children, there's the advantage of a full-volume encyclopedia that's updated every three months. To make learning geography fun, there's an online version of the popular Carmen San Diego, And there are colorful, interactive science features like Nova. Prodigy shows kids that learning can be fun and even helps them get started with computers. With Prodigy, everyone in your family has a whole new way to enjoy learning, communicating, and discovering. You can even try Prodigy without risk. Just call this toll-free number and we'll send you Prodigy software and one month's membership, all free. Spend a month with Prodigy, learning, exploring, playing, and trying all the great features that are there for you and your family to enjoy. Call this number and get live on Prodigy now. You may think there's nothing more natural than a simple glass of wine. After all, apart from some automated machinery and some fancy labelling, the techniques for producing it haven't changed much in centuries. Well, unfortunately, wrong. Today there isn't a winemaker anywhere that doesn't use a range of chemicals to bring you all of this. Everything from preservatives to sulphur dioxide are added to stabilise and control the fermentation process. But there is one bodega or cellar here in Spain that's unique in all the world for producing a truly natural product. They call it Vinos Ecologica, or ecological wine. Although ecological wine is produced in other parts of the world, nowhere have they matched the mass production techniques of the Alvarez e Diaz vineyard in northern Spain. The process starts with the Verdejo Blanco grape, the oldest known variety on the Iberian Peninsula. The grapes are grown without the use of pesticides or fungicides, only organic fertilizers. But although the resultant wine is completely natural, it will take the application of advanced biological techniques to keep it that way. Once the grapes are picked, the winery Alvarez e Diaz does things very differently. For a start, everything here is spotlessly clean to discourage bacteria. 
The grape juice is extracted using very little pressure, just two kilograms, which means the skins aren't broken and the stems aren't crushed. The result is a clear sediment-free liquid with very little material that can react with the air. But it's the laboratories of the winery that create the real magic. Here they've mastered the techniques of taking the microflora or yeast on the skins of the grape, refining them and reapplying them to the wine to control and stabilize the delicate chemistry that turns grape juice into wine. The inventor of the process is a scientist with a passion for fungus, Dr. Inigo Leal. For 35 years, he studied bacteria from all of Spain's 23 wine-growing regions, gathering the nation's foremost collection of bacterial strains, more than 2,000 in all. Over the years, he's developed a theory that the naturally occurring yeasts, bacteria, and molds don't have to be destroyed by sulfur dioxide. Instead, they can be turned to the wine grower's advantage. He's something of an eccentric among scientists. He even writes poetry about his beloved fungus. He told me how Louis Pasteur, the father of modern fermentation technique, had a dream of wine without additives. But the pasteurization of wine destroyed its color and flavor. It's only the development of modern microbiology that makes that dream possible. To make wine without chemicals requires very precise identification of the natural grape yeasts. Three or four are selected, and over a period of time, they're encouraged. These dominant strains are progressively filtered from the rest and cultured in large quantities. This process will happen once with each vintage until these super yeasts are reintroduced to the grape juice. There'll be one more period of yeast growth in the winery before it joins the juice at just the right moment. The Mentel Blanco, as this wine is labelled, will lie inert in these stainless steel tanks for about a year and a half, building up their own immunity to bacteria and disease. Along the way, their temperature and pH level will be constantly monitored. It's one way of avoiding the scandals of illegal wine additives that have ruined reputations amongst wine growers in Austria, Australia and France in recent times. It's wine based on biology, not chemistry. And for Spain's wine industry, there's another important advantage. This method will preserve the local differences that give regional wines their distinct character. The all too common use of introduced yeasts, especially from France, were beginning to make all the wines taste much the same. Now their personality can be restored. It all sounds simple enough, but in fact it's taken great courage to apply these unproven techniques on a commercial scale. We've become so used to all the junk in our wine, there simply is no classification for a truly natural product. But wine growers around the world are watching all of this with great interest. What's amazed the industry even more is that the wine also improves with age, just like its chemical cousins. Aged in wood casks before bottling, it's then held for at least another six months, and it gets better and better. But don't take my word for it. The home of this wine is Nava del Rey. Just a little place, really, a couple of thousand people, but more than 30 bars in the main street, and the local tipplers are hard to impress. Bullfighting may be Spain's national passion, but drinking is the national pastime. An ecological wine has come under close scrutiny. And the big question, I suppose, is how does it taste? Well, I'm no wine expert, but in the interest of science, I've been sitting here for just a little while finding out. And all I can say is it's delicious and getting better by the moment. Salute. Still to come on Beyond 2000, the search for the world's biggest dinosaur. But after the break, the narrowing gap between the original and the copy. Start a project with Minwax Wood Finish and turn new into treasured, secondhand into first rate, ordinary into extraordinary. Because Minwax Wood Finish makes it easy to turn any project into a beautiful masterpiece. Minwax makes wood beautiful.
this summer, Axel Foley. Is this the illegal chop shop? Is in for the ride of his life. Eddie Murphy. Trust me on this one, okay? Beverly Hills Cop 3, rated R. It's on May 25th everywhere. As we developed the new Porsche 911 Carrera, our German test center was buzzing with new thinking. A radical new suspension. A more powerful engine. The suggestions came from far and wide. Of course, the new 911 is still available in red, black and white. But uh, what fun would that be? We take it for granted, but twice every day, it happens. Water reclaiming the land, earth returning to sea. In between, in an unusual place, an amazing event happens. Life, renewing and changing, beginning over, twice every day, where land meets sea. On the Living Planet, Wednesday at 8 Eastern, 7 Central, only on the Discovery Channel. For the lover of fine art, this place is the closest thing to heaven on earth. The National Gallery in London houses some of the art world's most revered works, not least of which are paintings by the Impressionists, Renoir, Monet, Pissarro and Cezanne. Over the years, thousands of artists have endeavoured to capture the same magical qualities of these masterpieces. They've tried, but rarely with any success. About the closest you and I will come to owning one of these paintings is through an $80 or $90 print from the local picture store. But on the other side of the Atlantic, laser technology has taken to the brush with some breathtaking and affordable results. private gallery just outside Toronto in Canada. If some of the works begin to look a little familiar, rest assured, the originals are still firmly in place on the walls of the National Gallery. What you're looking at are reproductions of those paintings, as well as others by contemporary artists. Closer inspection reveals they are no run-of-the-mill reproductions. If you realise that up to, for 200 years people have been trying to to reproduce art that looked like the originals. And the closest we've been able to come is lithographs and serigraphs. But you have to realize that lithographs and serigraphs are still ink on paper and one-dimensional. The artograph process is three-dimensional oil on canvas, which replicates the originals just about exact. The artograph process begins with a color separation camera a highly advanced optical system that takes its image direct from the original. Capturing the colours precisely is a major part of the art to autograph. On a drum which rotates at high speed, a laser scanning beam reads off the changes in colour gradation and detail. The print is then made on a specially developed oil-based foil, one layer after another. With a mixture that remains a closely guarded secret, well, Colonel Sanders never mentioned how he cooked chicken, a mould is then poured onto the original. In this case, a painting by Canadian artist Mitch Kierstead. Well, just like taking a set jelly from the fridge, 72 hours later, the mould is removed from the original, leaving the surface perfectly intact, with no residue left behind and no damage whatsoever. So what we're left with is a faithful reproduction of the original, with all the brush strokes and texture in a negative form. The company can use this as many times as is necessary. It can be heated, frozen and even put under 120 tonnes of pressure without any damage to the composition. The print is then carefully placed on a unique laminated canvas material, all of which is laid atop the negative mould. Our cooking theme continues. 
as Sammy places the ingredients into an oven. Come pressure cooker, come freezer. The lithograph becomes liquid under heating, filling into all the cracks and crevices on the mould. A quick freeze and the autograph edition is complete, minus the frame of course. After checking the surface, the reproduction is ready to go onto the shelf. The last stage has taken just a few minutes. It took us about two years to develop materials that were authentic. And it also took us about the same amount of time, which we did concurrently, in developing equipment to be able to produce the product. Now comes the acid test, comparing the original with the reproduction. And even from this distance, I would challenge anyone with or without a passing interest in the art world to tell the difference. The colours in the reproduction, even down to the subtlest hues, are remarkably true to the original. So, for the answer to the $64,000 question, come in close. All right, 10 points to those who guessed this one as the original and this one as the reproduction. Seeing is one thing, but feeling is believing. Extreme close-ups of the copy resemble a map of the moon surface. The process is especially effective with paintings done with palette knives or thick brush strokes. The former is the method employed by the very same Mitch Kierstead. He and many other artists see the autograph editions not as a threat, but a refreshing new perspective to their field. My immediate response, and often that of other people when they hear of all this, concerns fakes and abuses of such a process. Well, it did happen once. The offender was apprehended, and it's never happened since. We put an indelible rubber stamp on the back of the picture to, to make people aware that, that will not come off the canvas, that makes people aware that these are not originals, but they're artograph editions. Some of the purists may cry foul. However, we live in an age of reproduction, so why not fine art? In North America alone, the reproduction market is estimated to be about $6 billion annually. At today's prices, that won't buy you too many Renoir or Van Gogh originals. If for a few hundred dollars you can have one hanging in your living room, perhaps even the masters themselves would dip their brush to modern technology. In the 80s, we've perfected the idea of the throwaway society. Things are rarely built to last and few of us recycle our rubbish. We've got uh, disposable cigarette lighters, pens, napkins, knives and forks, and yuck, throwaway food. And now, the latest fashion accessory from Japan, the throwaway watch. They're made from cardboard with a tiny liquid crystal display timepiece in the middle and they come in a range of styles like uh, bacon, camouflage and uh, crocodile. The batteries last about nine months, but you'll probably lose it before then, which is just as well because there's a limit to how long you can stay fashionable wearing something like this. Next, travel to space and back on Frontiers of Flight. Then see Alaska at war on Discovery Showcase. And investigate the Russian Mafia on Discovery Journey. Coming up on the Discovery Channel. Hi. My name is Travis. And I'm an addict. My life used to be all about destruction and looking for the next big score. Video games were all I could think of. Then my dad got me the new Crayola Art Studio for my computer. Now I'm making my own cartoons and playing really cool games. I'm creating stuff. The new Crayola software by Micrographics, because it's cool to be creative. And I still get to blow things up. Presenting an average day in the life of an average American family. They learned how to surf, walk, and talk all at the same time. I've ridden the fastest and the biggest waves ever ridden. And not many dads can say that. I always tell the boys to drive safely, because pavement's a harder go down than water. The water's flying over your head, and it's sparkling, and diamonds are flying. We're a family, but we haven't exactly settled down. Thursdays, nuts and bolts, tools of the trade. 
the everyday and the extraordinary. Movie Magic, followed by The Secret Life of Machines, Thursdays at 9 Eastern, 8 Central, on the Discovery Channel. Where can you find water that tastes like this? Canada? The Rockies? The Alps? Try Brooklyn, Chicago, Los Angeles, because no matter where you live, you can get great tasting water with the Brita water filtering pitcher. Brita turns your tap water into water that tastes like this. And it's so easy to use. Just turn on the tap, fill the reservoir, and watch as the water passes through the patented filter. The silverized carbon reduces chlorine taste, odors, and sediment. And the special ion exchange process eliminates 93% of the lead and copper. The complete Brita unit comes with a lightweight, durable pitcher and patented replaceable filter good for 35 gallons. The end result? Water that tastes like this. And Brita is sold everywhere, along with a money-back guarantee. Call this number now for more details and the store nearest you. With Brita, you don't have to travel to great lengths to get great tasting water. It comes right from your tap. Brita, tap into great tasting water. We humans are basically tropical animals who have managed to adapt successfully to a wide range of environments. To date, science has shown intense interest in how men and women react to space travel and to underwater exploration. But there are other challenges to human physiology awaiting discovery. This is the last great frontier, Antarctica. It's bigger than all of Europe. It's bigger than the US of A. And though 90% of the world's fresh water is now trapped in this ice cap, that was deposited over millions of years. Now the continent is dry, desert dry, and cold beyond belief. The coldest temperature ever recorded on Earth was recorded here at almost minus 90 degrees centigrade. And that's almost 130 degrees below on the Fahrenheit scale. Add to that winds that are as strong as any hurricane or cyclone, except that instead of blowing for hours and days, they blow for weeks or longer. So what happens when you take tropical humans and place them in this environment? I think a man spending his life in Antarctica would probably only live to be uh, maybe 45, 50, 55. Because the environment's that harsh? Because the environment's harsh, yes. It certainly is harsh enough to kill. And uh, since uh, uh, the Australian National Antarctic Research Expedition, ANARI, started in 47, we've had 16 deaths. The United States, from around the same time, with a much larger wintering population, have had some 50 deaths. Although industrial-type accidents, remote from sophisticated medical help, have claimed many of those lives, the natural elements of wind and cold can kill by a process of rapid cooling, fast-moving air blowing the heat away from your body. It's a process best illustrated with the aid of a wind chill chart. Even at quite low temperatures, when well-clothed and in the absence of wind, humans can be relatively comfortable. But even quite modest increases in wind speed rapidly chill the body to a critical state. Early medical research in Antarctica showed how humans are able to adapt, within reason, to the cold. Today, vastly improved clothing from thermal underwear, Gore-Tex linings and windproof coverings has meant that work is at least possible, if not totally enjoyable, under all sorts of conditions. It looks pleasant now. In fact, it's late in the evening and the, the winds have dropped back, so it's very pleasant to work. But within hours, those blizzard conditions could be back. Now, when you read about and you talk to people who have wintered here and experienced those blizzards, you marvel that more haven't perished. But you also gain a newfound respect for the human physiology that enables men and women to survive physically and mentally, no matter what gets thrown at them. Dr. Des Lug knows better than most what expeditioners have to face. This is his 16th time to Antarctica, 
where he's directed the medical research into many aspects of the Antarctic experience. Yes, it is cold, yes, it is windy, but it's the isolation. You are here and you know that when once the end of summer comes, you can't get out, nor can anyone get in until the summer returns. Now, nowhere in the Arctic, nor in Australia or most other countries, are people so isolated. They all understand well what it feels like to be left here to face a long winter, knowing there is no escape until the following summer. Only then will the first ship make it through the ice. That reality sinks in as winter approaches. It's a really complex um, thing that's happening, is that people are getting to know each other better. They're becoming part of a community, but the depression is starting to set in because they're away from family, friends. It's starts to hit rock bottom when the, when the sun doesn't come up anymore. It's very difficult to keep working in that environment, getting up in the dark, going to work all day in the dark and coming home in the dark. Now, when early expeditioners came here, they brought straitjackets and coffins because no one knew how humans would respond to such conditions. Today, they're finding out by researching both the physical and psychological responses to those conditions. With all these people here locked away for the winter, we can do serial studies on their mood and their behaviour and see if there's any link with any of these variables in the, the weather, cosmic rays, upper atmosphere physics, ground vibration, magnetic fields. Hello, Brian. Jump up. Yes. Dr Lug has supervised much of Australia's medical research on its expeditions. With many co-workers, the teams have looked at why some visitors to Antarctica experience a huge drop in immunity. As well, looking at fundamental questions about the transmission of cold and flu viruses. Now these isolated groups, where not even mail gets delivered, provides unique conditions for medical research. For many years we said people came to Antarctica, they wintered 12, 15, 16 months, went home, retribalised, a great word we used to retribalise back into society and all was well. But over recent times I think uh, in the wide variety of areas that we've studied, I don't think that's quite true and I'm convinced that there are greater stressors on people down here than we'd previously imagined. But at least at the psychological level, Mawson has a unique element that meets with glowing approval. There are times at Mawson when the, 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 the conversation um, and the thoughts are dominated for perhaps weeks on end by the dogs. And uh, they're, they're marvellous animals. They're, they're big and they're strong and they're individuals. They're affectionate and they have their own uh, social structure and they're marvellous creatures to relate to. Psychiatry on the cheap? Yes, that's right. But if conditions at this, the loneliest of regions, causes our fellow humans to respond so strongly to a little canine companionship, why do people continue to come here? Even more bewildering, what can weave so potent a spell as to lure Dr. Lug back for this, his 16th visit? Each time I come, I say it's the last time, but from seeing the first iceberg to seeing the last iceberg, it is a superbly beautiful region. I guess, uh, I realise just how insignificant man is in this continent when you can look out over the polar ice cap and say, well, there's no one for thousands and thousands of miles and be correct. We'll search for the stuff movies are made of when we return to Beyond 2000. They come over to America and it's a candy store and they're really not afraid of law. They have evaded throughout the United States over $1 billion a year. 
They usually come in, do their business, and leave. See how the Russian mafia has taken the American dream by storm. Don't miss Vodka Dons, a Discovery Journal special. Tonight at 10 Eastern, 9 Central, contains violent material. Parental discretion is advised. Uncover ancient mysteries and explore mythical cultures that have long since disappeared. Join an expedition into the past on Terra X. Then, set aside reality and enter forbidden lands where sorcery, witchcraft, and voodoo are still a part of everyday life. On Magical Worlds, Terra X and Magical Worlds, Tuesdays beginning at 8 Eastern, 7 Central, only on the Discovery Channel. You're still making great lasagna. My son is making it now. I'll tell you, a while back, I didn't think there'd be a restaurant for him. This place? It's always busy. Well, it wasn't the problem. It was everything else. It was insurance and health plans. My guy at Payne Wibbery helped me out with all that. The stockbroker? Yes, yeah, he even set us up with a 401k. I guess you must really know how important this place is to your family. Yeah. Because he took the time to ask. surprised what a BMW convertible is going for these days. The new 318i. Since the first huge fossil bones were excavated more than 200 years ago, dinosaurs have captured the popular imagination. Thousands of bones have been unearthed and classified, but how the dinosaurs lived and why they became extinct remain a mystery. And even though Hollywood has brought dinosaurs into the 20th century with images like these, the methods used to excavate them have changed little since the 1700s. Fossils were first found at this site in the Gemez Mountains of New Mexico by hikers in 1979. It could take several more decades to fully excavate, but even if nothing else is found here, this site has already rewritten the dinosaur textbooks. One of the New Mexico dinosaurs, the Seismosaurus, is the biggest dinosaur ever discovered. He's known as the Earthshaker, and for very good reason. He was as long as three coaches. He weighed as much as six, which is about 80 tons. His shoulder would have been about this high and his head could have seen over the top of a five-storey building. So far, 25 blocks of bone-bearing sandstone, each weighing 20 tonnes, have been removed from the dig. Their destination is the New Mexico Museum of Natural History in Albuquerque. The museum is a mecca for dinosaur buffs. Volunteers spend hours etching away at sandstone that's held the Seismosaurus captive for 150 million years. Like excavation, the preparation of the bones for storage and display has changed little in the last two centuries. These femurs will take two months to isolate from their matrix, after which they'll be ready to join the vertebrae and tailbones of the Seismosaurus already on display. Devoting only two months to history's best set of thighs, certainly its biggest, seems ironic when you consider the age of the beast. But remember, there's a lot more dinosaur yet to be uncovered. That's, of course, if they find it again. It's hard to believe you could lose a 110-foot dinosaur, but that seems to be what's happened here. At first it was easy. They found the tail bones and the tail vertebrae right on the surface. Then the body curved away and the hips are embedded down here in the rock of the cliff face. But what happens next is anyone's guess. Its neck and shoulders certainly didn't show up where they were expected to. One theory is that rigor mortis bent the Seismosaurus's body back on itself, which would put the neck and head at a 90 degree angle to its pelvis. Then again, the dig site is on an old riverbed and it's not uncommon for rivers to change their course over the years and sweep remains away. 
Wherever they are, the bones are covered by two or three metres of sandstone and paleontologists would welcome anything that made them easier to find. Into the boys and their toys. Just as finding a needle in a haystack is easier if you have a metal detector, scientists from Los Alamos Research Centre hope their remote sensing devices will make finding dinosaur bones in solid rock a lot easier. The Los Alamos team comes to the site every weekend to test their gadgets. Some of the devices have been used before, while others are very much in their infancy. A magnetometer measures variations in the Earth's magnetic field. Since dinosaur bones are known to accumulate iron, any anomalies in the readout may indicate the presence of fossilised bones in the rock. Another sensing device, right. the gamma ray spectroscope, works on the basis that dinosaur bones also accumulate okay, uranium. So half an inch or so of lead because the detector is protected on three lead sides by lead, the researchers can work out which direction the strongest emissions are coming from and get a reasonable idea of okay. where the bone may be laying. Other scientists are using ground-penetrating radar to see if anomalies in the wave pattern they produce indicate an artifact beneath the surface. There's the center, there's the anomaly right there. It is. It's just a couple of feet the other side of it. Radar detectors have been used in the past to locate Egyptian tombs, but using one to find fossils is a new challenge. The Earth conductivity meter measures the Earth's electrical resistance and looks for things which alter that reading. Just how bone affects electrical resistance is a bit of a mystery, but it's hoped a pattern will emerge. Although the technology is unproven, to some extent the future of this excavation depends on it. The concern which is uppermost in everyone's mind is that this whole area is both a dinosaur boneyard and a wilderness site, and paleontologists simply won't be allowed to excavate the entire hillside. Unless remote sensing devices can pinpoint the bones and minimise the impact of the excavations, it's likely the Seismosaurus will remain trapped forever in its sandstone prison. Up next on the Discovery Channel, find yourself on a round trip journey into space on Frontiers of Flight. Later on Discovery Showcase, explore Japan's encroachment upon the Aleutian Islands on Alaska at War. Explore your world. Time to find out why people are buying the Mercury Villager instead of our minivan. After you, sir. We all can't fit in here. Oh, no, you just slide the seat back. It's actually very uh, complicated. Like a V6 leather CD player, if you like that sort of thing, which I... How does it drive? Great. I mean... Ah! It also has standard four-wheel anti-lock brakes. <laughs> the Mercury Villager. All this on the quality of a Mercury. 
Hi, I'm Mark Anderson. I'm David Jones with MCI. We think the best thing we can show new customers at MCI is what we do for our current customers. I save $166 per year with best friends. Teresa, I see the savings, but what about our service? That's my favorite part. The people at MCI are the biggest reason I continue to feel like a valued customer. The most crucial thing we need to do is know our customers. The MCI representatives are just the best. They talk to you very honestly. A lot of hard work goes into making sure they're happy. I'm sticking with MCI. We're going to do whatever it takes to keep you a happy customer. And you have our word on it. and automakers are at odds again now that 12 eastern states from Maine to Virginia want only cars with reduced emissions to be available after 1998. If the EPA agrees, car makers will have to cut emissions by more than half and put many more electric cars on the road. The industry is balking, saying electric cars will never sell, but they're actually lobbying against their own technology. Electric prototypes like GM's Impact cause virtually no air pollution and lightweight, super strong materials can double a car's mileage and still make it safe. Research engineers say one day they'll be making an ultralight vehicle powered by gas and electricity that will go coast to coast on a single tank of fuel. But for now, many regulators say the auto industry won't get charged up about the electric car until it's a guaranteed profit maker. I'm Lori Stokes for the Discovery Channel. Normandy, the Great Crusade. An officer said, there are only two men on this beach, those who are dead and those who are about to be dead. Actor Charles Durning, narrator and Normandy veteran. We changed history. It was a battle that went on for 12 weeks, involved two million men, and there are obviously at least two million stories. Writer and producer Chris Koch. We decided what we wanted to do was tell a very human story and this human story even includes a German perspective. Normandy, the Great Crusade. Explore their world. Monday, May 30th at 9 Eastern, 8 Central. Only on the Discovery Channel. The world should never forget what happened. If you don't remember history, you're doomed to relive it. Join host Roger Kennedy as he demystifies the image of the villainous buccaneer. Don't miss Rediscovering America, Pirates, Sunday at 7 Eastern, 6 Central, only on the Discovery Channel. Next, travel to space and back on Frontiers of Flight. Then, see Alaska at war on Discovery Showcase. And investigate the Russian Mafia on Discovery Journey, coming up on the Discovery Channel.